Hello everyone, thank you for coming uh, today. My name is Erika De Benedetti and I will manage this webinar. Before to get started, I would like to give you a couple of information. Firstly, this webinar is recorded and the recording will be available on biostimulant.com website and on our social media in the next days. Secondly, I invite you to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We will collect your questions and answer to at least some of them at the end of the presentation. The topic of today is plant and the seed priming as green tools for sustainable agriculture under a changing climate. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Vasilis Fotopoulos, Associate Professor in Structural and Functional Plant Biology, Department of Agricultural Sciences, Biotechnology and Food Science at Cyprus University of Technology. So welcome, Professor. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Erika, and thank you for the very kind invitation and to Giuseppe as well for kindly asking to give this uh, presentation. So today uh, I shall be talking about the uh, work that we've been doing in the group for the last God, uh, 12, 13 years now, quite a long time, where we are effectively employing different priming tools uh, towards a more sustainable agriculture under a changing climate, both for growth promotion, but also for stress protection. And uh, a part of that is, I think, relevant to the biostimulant community uh, because we employ uh, natural metabolites quite uh, strongly, uh, which might be considered a form of biostimulation. Of course, this is up for discussion. But also, we'll talk about other methods that we've been using, also focusing on a recent uh, advancement uh, using also nanomaterials. So uh, let me just share my screen for a second. So, OK. So there we go. Mm. It's clear now, perfect. So as a very brief overview, and I shouldn't waste too much time on that, on the work that we do in uh, the group, uh, we started off examining plant responses to abiotic stressors mainly, so covering climate change related change uh, scenario like drought, salt, extreme temperatures and heavy metals, but also we've been examining combinations of stressors that are quite uh, relevant for real life scenario like drought and insect attack. And as well as the effect of pharmaceutically active compounds, because wastewater irrigation is becoming very important, a big reality. So the effect of TECs is also quite interesting. Now, through a strong collaboration with the sister group here in the department, we also examine quite a lot uh, secondary metabolism linked with antioxidant offense, which is mainly linked with uh, fruit crop uh, species. But as I said before, the main volume of work in the plant stress physiology group is actually linked with uh, the evaluation of priming agents against the uh, stressors. And this covers, as I said, chemical factors, chemical uh, priming, which can be either with natural metabolites that is more appropriate for biostimulating activities. Also, there is some work with synthetic compounds that is not linked with uh, the biostimulant approach. Uh, we actually, through collaboration that I will talk about, talk about biological priming with uh, microorganisms, which is highly relevant to the interest of this audience. But also lately, we use a lot of nanomaterials. And of course, uh, we are also now using actual biostimulants in terms of formulations that are available in the market as part of the treatments. And uh, an interesting finding is that in addition to the stress protection, they actually also have strong indications that uh, they lead to improved growth and development either under uh, non-stressful conditions. I wouldn't call them optimal, but not really stressful conditions. So as everybody is aware, plants are sessile organisms. So effectively they are, because they're stuck to the ground, they have to fight off any challenges, either in the form of abiotic stresses or biotic stresses, uh, by actually uh, developing advanced uh, biochemical and molecular uh, response pathways. So the plant, by receiving multiple environmental stimuli, switches on in response to the accumulation of signal molecules, several metabolic defense pathways in an attempt to try to defend itself from all of those pressures. So of course, everybody 
knows the impact of abiotic stress on crop production. Uh, virtually 96% of the global rural land area is affected by some sort of stressor. And actually, of course, this is further supported by the huge number of publications in scientific literature. This shows the importance of this uh, problem. So basic science is good, examining the responses, but we need solutions. So what are the solutions for that? Of course, one solution would be genetic modification, but this is not really easy to apply in countries such as Cyprus, which is relatively anti-GM in principle. And this is quite similar, of course, to many European nations. Now, of course, with the CRISPR-Cas movement, we're hoping and expecting for this to change, but this is the reality for the time being. Uh, of course, there is also conventional breeding approaches through the selection of tolerant cultivars, but we believe that an attractive alternative solution is that of plant priming, because it combines positive benefits of both of the uh, of uh, the previously established uh, technologies that I mentioned before. So for people who are not aware of the concept, although I assume that this specific audience is well aware of the concept of priming, uh, the process of priming involves prior exposure to the stressor itself, thus making the plant more tolerant to future exposure. Uh, so effectively, this would mean that with physiological priming or with hardening as some people call it you would pre-stress the plant with mild levels of stress of drought or salt stress and so on and then in the future exposure to more severe stress conditions it would be more uh, prepared to protect itself so the priming in principle i should say theoretically resembles the approach of uh, vaccination in the sense that of course the plant will not produce on the antibodies but uh, it's the same logic in that by pre-stressing or pre-treating uh, the organism, actually you render it more uh, ready to actually fight off future um, exposure to stress factors. And of course, priming can also be achieved chemically by applying exogenous uh, compounds, either natural metabolites, which is relevant to the biostimulant story, or synthetic compounds that act as signal transducers, thus activating, as I said, the plant's defense system. Hence the analogy with vaccination. So uh, this is just a model showing pretty much uh, the concept of uh, priming and what is happening in the plant. So as you can see on the left, uh, pre-treatment of a plant with an agent, priming agent, uh, thus render, rendering the plant in a prime state, it would lead to the concept of a signal perception and systemic conduction of the signal through the vascular tissues that would result in uh, the accumulation of what we believe are dormant tolerance activators. And then in the future exposure to the stressor, such as drought or salinity and so on, then the plant will actually fastly activate defense pathways, either in the form of induction of stress inducible transcription factors, a number of post translational modifications, uh, some of which I will present in a second, uh, upregulation of stress responsive genes, but importantly also. Uh, assist towards reaching ionic homeostasis, osmotic protection, reactive oxygen species detoxification, and finally, physiological uh, improved performance. So the other thing we do know uh, is that reactive species are important in this uh, response. And there is an interplay between different versions of reactive species. So effectively, this mainly covers reactive oxygen species, such as hydrogen peroxide and superoxide radicals, nitric oxide, uh, sorry, uh, reactive nitrogen species, such as nitric oxide, for example. And of course, there is also reactive sulfur species, such as uh, hydrogen sulfide. And we do know that there is a crosstalk between the, these different reactive species that in low concentrations act as signal transducers and are involved with a number of uh, procedures, such as uh, response to stresses, but also to growth and development. But of course, if uh, these concentrations become quite high, they become toxic uh, for the plant cell. So, so far we've actually uh, tried out many, many different approaches of priming on different uh, plants, both model plants such as Arabidopsis and Medicago, but also crop plant species, such as strawberries, citrus, uh, tomato, cucumber, and so on. So I will now go briefly through main technologies that we've evaluated uh, through this approach. And here we see some earlier work where we're actually using 
a natural plant gas transmitter, hydrogen sulfide, through a donation with a donor called sodium hydrosulfide. And these are hydro hydroponically grown uh, strawberry plants under both either salt stress or polyethylene glycol stress, so hyperosmotic stress, of course, either ionic or non ionic. And as you can see, the plants that are stressed, you can see them here. Uh, uh, these are the salt stressed plants, and these are the peck stressed plants, so severe symptoms. But actually, when these plants were actually pre treated with the donors that I mentioned before, in the case of salinity or peck stress, we had the recovery of the phenotype, so very nice protection. And we saw actually that this was linked to uh, the upregulation of a number of uh, trans uh, transcriptional activation of a number of defense pathways. Uh, so here you see in the stressed plants that we have a severe suppression of a number of defense-related genes for both stresses that cover antioxidants, genes involved in uh, uh, redox components, such as aspartic and glutathione, uh, components of the salt overly sensitive pathway, and so on. And what we saw was that this severe suppression of the stressors was uh, reversed, uh, actually reaching control levels when the plants were pre-treated with our uh, gasotransmitter, which is a natural gasotransmitter found in uh, living cells. Uh, here, there's another case of reactive species priming. In this case, uh, both either hydrogen peroxide or nitric oxide. Nitric oxide was specifically donated through the use of uh, sodium nitric oxide, which is quite commonly used. And here, we actually saw in this uh, piece of work that the signal uh, was uh, systemically uh, translocated through the vascular tissues in the xylem of the flow. And there was also a self propagating effect. So basically, uh, we had the novel uh, production of the reactive species, uh, even after the uh, application of the exogenous uh, donors. And uh, a proteomic analysis uh, revealed, quite interestingly, that the number of post transcriptional modifications, uh, post translational modifications, are taking effect in the treated plants. So a profile of s nitrosylated tyrosinate-rated, and carbonylated proteins was actually examined in a, tempo, in a spatial manner in leaves and roots of citrus plants in this case. And what we saw was that, interestingly, priming with the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species resulted in the upregulation of a number of s nitrosylated proteins and the suppression of a number of tyrosinate-rated and carbonylated proteins. And the upregulation of the nitrosylated ones was mainly linked with uh, uh, proteins involved in photosynthesis. So safeguarding that the plant would actually effectively and efficiently photosynthesize even under stress conditions. And uh, the next level of research for us is to actually try to see if we can get the additive or cumulative effect of combining uh, different donors. So this is an example of a a relatively recent study where there was a combination of treatments of different gasotransmitters, uh, in this case, uh, of different reactive species. In this case, it was uh, uh, donating nitric oxide along with hydrogen oxide. And we actually saw that these acted synergistically uh, in sweet basil plants that were grown against uh, salt stress. And the other thing that was quite interesting to see is that the application, the combined application of the reactive species donors actually resulted in the regulation of the essential oil content and profile as well, mainly affecting specific essential oils, such as methylphenol, linalool, and cadimol. So uh, another example of a natural metabolite, that is a hormonal uh, compound, like a, a, a molecule with hormonal -like activity that is quite trendy, I would say, nowadays, is through the use of melatonin. That some of you might know because uh, people use it to regulate uh, sleep patterns. Uh, in plants, plants actually produce it themselves, uh, some of them more than others, like almonds and cherries. And uh, here we actually applied this uh, molecule, natural metabolite, I repeat, in uh, medicago plants that were under severe, as you can see, drought stress. And we actually had a reversal of the damaged phenotype in the primed plants uh, quite efficiently, I would say. And we actually noticed that this uh, clear protection was mainly linked through the suppression of the nitrosative stress response. So the active nitrogen species that were produced in excess in the damaged plants were effectively reversed 
uh, in uh, the plants that were actually primed with uh, melatonin and other molecules that are natural metabolites and are known to have hormonal like activity that we work with include also polyamines. So uh, as you might be aware, polyamines are low molecular weight nitrogen containing compounds and they are also involved in a number of uh, developmental and defense uh, uh, pathways in the plant. And they're highly linked with uh, uh, stress response uh, situations. So the main uh, polymers are effectively petroskin, spermin, and spermin. Although uh, lately, uh, the role of thermospermin is also quite heavily being uh, researched. So in this case, for example, it was an approach where plants were applied exogenously with uh, either petroskin or spermin in spermin. Uh, this is citrus plants. Uh, uh, this is our orange. And this was for plants that were effectively under salt stress conditions. And uh, effectively, what we saw was all of the polyamines uh, led to improved performance under salt stress, effectively improving quite a lot the osmo regulating uh, role of these molecules uh, because we reached the uh, better levels of. Uh, homeostasis uh, for osmoprotective uh, responses. And uh, the optimal uh, protection, I would say, was effectively seen with the sperm in particular, although all of them showed some sort of improvement. And uh, now I will have a, introduce a parenthesis in my talk to close with the work that can be done with priming agents uh, to talk about synthetic agents. And of course, this is not linked with the biostimulating side of the story with what would be more compatible biocompatible, of course, as you can understand, but for fundamental science, this is also quite interesting and important to examine. So we've examined a few molecules, synthetic chemicals uh, for their priming activity. And one of them was interestingly strobilurins. Uh, and this is important because strobilurins are a very commonly used fungicide in the industry. And their function, their uh, fungicidal activity is attributed to an inhibition of fungal respiration. But empirically, growers, what they would see in fields sprayed with strobilurins, such as Chrysoxin methyl, for example, they would actually notice greening of the plants, improved performance, so growth promoting effects, one would say. So this actually prompted us to examine potential uh, priming effects of uh, these compounds. And indeed, we managed to achieve protection in Medicaro Trancatula plants against both uh, drought and salinity stress. And this was supported by extensive omics analysis. We carried out uh, microarray analysis with uh, full genome affymetrics chips, where a number of uh, gene families were found to be regulated in response to priming with methyl uh, prior drought stress imposition in particular. And of course, we also proceeded with carrying out metabolomic profiling through a collaborating laboratory that interestingly showed that uh, a mode of action of this molecule was through uh, the lowering of free amino acids uh, that indicated, of course, that there was uh, perhaps suppressed protein degradation levels. And uh, further work on this molecule, so a strong collaboration with BAB Center in Ghent, uh, showed that the strobilurins uh, in even lower concentrations, and you have to consider that strobilurins are usually applied in the 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 4 level. And for the stress protecting role, we're going down to the 10 to the minus 9, 10 molar, really low. But even further down, even 10 to the minus 11 or 12 molar, we actually could see that there was significant increases in growth. So you could see that the project Rosetti and the Rabidopsis plants were significantly increased following treatment with the Chrysoxin method. And this was interesting because we observed that this increase in growth was attributed to increase in cell number and not cell area. So effectively, uh, cell proliferation and not cell expansion. And the RNA sequencing analysis revealed a number of genes that are involved in the response of uh, uh, priming with the strobilurins. And most of them were actually part of a similar family, the BHLH transcription factors. So no doubt, Newton work actually revealed indeed the involvement of these specific uh, BHLases 
in the response of plants to drought, but also uh, in the in the growth promoting effect. I mean, of uh, strawberry urines uh, in Arabidopsis plants. So the second and last example of a uh, chemical priming, but with uh, synthetic molecules is uh, through a proprietary technology called NOSH and NOSH aspirin. These molecules are uh, hybrid donors, are synthetic chimeras that have been developed as anti-cancer drugs. And effectively, uh, NOSH, both NOSH and NOSH aspirin have moieties for donation of uh, hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide, but NOSH aspirin, as the word would actually uh, confess, also uh, donates uh, acetyl salicylic acid. And of course, as you can understand, NO and H2S are natural gasotransmitters in plants, naturally biosynthesized and uh, detected, but also acetyl salicylic acid is an analog of the uh, assay of salicylic acid that is also uh, found in all plant cells. And the big benefit of this specific donor is that it doesn't have smaller protein X linked with uh, hydrogen sulfate, which makes it more attractive for use in commercial applications. So uh, this work actually resulted in the filing and publishing publication of a uh, PCT for the patent uh, in several countries in the world. And as you can see, the plants that were severe, more than severely processed, they effectively died. The ones that were actually treated were primed with NOS aspirin as well as NOS. We had a much, much improved uh, protection of the phenotype and the physiology of the plant compared with the severely affected uh, drought stressed plant. And uh, currently, we're actually in the process of uh, preparing a publication with big data, where RNA sequencing analysis revealed again a number of genes that are involved in the protection of the plants with uh, this molecule. And this is supported by knockout work. And of course, we also carried out metabolomics and other big data analysis. And the last part of that, which is also interesting, is that we actually translated the information that was found obtained from Medicalhua on crops of major economic significance. So we optimized this donor to also have significant protection in the cereal crops. So we have data in maize and wheat plants under drought stress where their physiological performance was severely, was, was significantly improved uh, under drought stress conditions if they were connected with these uh, donors. Now, uh, another strategy of actually achieving uh, plant protection, another priming strategy is, as I mentioned before, biological priming. And biological priming involves microorganisms. So again, this is highly linked with the biostimulant uh, scenario, uh, because several biostimulants, as you well know, are based on microorganisms. So for this research, uh, we have a very strong collaborator actually in Italy, in Siena, uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Raffaella Balistrini, and we've carried out several evaluations of different microorganisms, mainly working with hypospular mycorrhizal fungi. So this is one example of work that was carried out in Arundodonax plants under salt stress, where these were actually treated with uh, different AMS, and specifically Phenoliformis mosaic and Rhizopagus irregularis. And we did see improvement in uh, behavior of plants under salt stress with the use of these uh, microorganisms, uh, improving uh, osmotic uh, homeostasis and so on. And uh, because we're always trying to kind of figure something out, which is a bit more novel and a new way to go, a new direction. You can make. So another thing we tried was to actually try to mix things up. So basically we try to examine also what would happen if we combine chemical priming agents uh, with biological ones. So this is another example of work we carried out in plants that were again salt stress, uh, uh, sorry, uh, drought stress in this case. And basically this involved uh, an approach where effectively the plants were uh, inoculated with AMS, again, specific uh, populations of AMS, but also primed chemically with uh, jasmonic acid, methyl jasmine. And again, uh, some degree of protection was observed. And this was linked also with the regulation of specific uh, hormones like oxygen and toxic acid. Um, however, uh, because priming uh, has many faces and many hats, uh, we're also currently jumped on what I call the biostimulant train, 
in terms of uh, using also uh, commercial formulations, either established ones as controls, but also checking the prototypes from interested companies. And the first thing that we noticed, and this for me is important actually being part of this uh, webinar and actually liaising with people from the field, uh, is also a matter of definitions because this is a quite, a, I wouldn't call it vague uh, scenery, but uh, there is uh, multiple opinions being expressed. And of course, uh, there is uh, opinions about definitions that are well established by experts in the field. So for example, uh, Patrick Jardin actually stated that the biostimulant is any substance or microorganism applied to plants with the aim to enhance nutrient efficiency, nutrition efficiency, stress tolerance, and or pork quality traits, regardless of the nutrient content. Uh, Joe and uh, Giuseppe, uh, Joe Rafael and Giuseppe Cola stated that plant biostimulants are defined as products obtained from different uh, substances or microorganisms that are able to improve plant growth productivity, but also, as I said, alleviate the negative effects of ergodic stresses. And in general, the, more, the best known components that could act as biostimulants are mineral elements, vitamins, uh, amino acids, uh, poly and oligosaccharides, uh, hormones, and so on. And this is why I stated before that work of ours, such as with polyamines, melatonin, and so on, could theoretically or even practically be uh, recognized as being biocompatible with biostimulant uh, activity. Uh, and specifically, this is an example of work that we've been doing with, uh, we did in the past in the commercial orchard uh, for thought through as part of the project where initial evaluation of some biostimulants was carried out with some promising results, but not conclusive. But uh, we're currently running, uh, involved in a big uh, Horizon Europe uh, project where we're indeed evaluating multiple different priming technologies uh, in these soft fruit uh, plants, mainly covering raspberry and strawberry publication. So there is a big potential for commercial reuse, even for crops of, uh, uh, that are very specific for their growing conditions and have a high added value such as uh, soft fruit crops. And another element we're examining through the use of these biostimulants and priming technologies is also potential improvements in nutritional quality in terms of phytochemical profits. Uh, this is another example of a company uh, that in the past approached us with some prototype uh, biostimulant formulations uh, where we actually evaluated these in tomato plants grown under salt stress. So this is published recently uh, in the scientific publication. And we also have quite nice data that will soon hopefully be uh, available. Uh, on plants that were also submitted and protected against the uh, drought stress. So the bottom line is that especially with the commercial formulations, like with many different things, our experience so far was that quite a lot of them do work very nicely. Quite a lot actually don't deliver what is expected, I would say. But I think it is also a case of uh, a proper experimental setup because you need very specific, specific windows, openings that you make to actually do this due to the multifactorial composition, because most of these formulations actually include many, many different things. That makes it very uh, specific on how to optimize the performance. Whereas single molecule chemical priming is, I would call it a bit more straightforward. Uh, and the second part of the talk, I will talk about uh, more recent advancements in our group. Because as I said, we're always striving to trying to find new priming approaches, uh, trying to set trends, if you may. And uh, recently, we've been focusing quite a lot on the use of nanomaterials. Uh, there is a huge library of nanomaterials, huge possibilities of synthesizing nanomaterials that can cover both organic and inorganic materials. Uh, and the interesting thing. Because again, uh, this this for many people would be not biocompatible because of the nature of these materials. But of course, there is also the potential, the proven potential to actually produce these nanomaterials in a green way. So effectively produce them from waste plant material, from uh, material of plant origin. 
And there is also the concept of uh, the brown synthesis where they can even reproduce from microorganisms. So the potential to produce these nanomaterials from uh, plant or microbial uh, cells uh, is very relevant. Uh, and I will now talk about different uh, approaches we've tried so far through a very strong collaboration in the group with Dr. Reza Bukhari. Uh, this is an example for, uh, of application of titanium dioxide nanoparticles, where we actually saw that they can act very nicely as uh, stress protectors in aromatic plants grown under salt stress. Uh, but also we observed that in specific concentrations, uh, this titanium dioxide also acts as a growth promoting agent under non stress conditions. Of course, here it has to be clear that because we're talking about nanoparticles, metal oxide, and so on, uh, the concentration is extremely important. We have a hermetic effect. So there are concentrations that we do see promising use, beneficial uh, effects. But of course, uh, there's a thin line between that and actually switching to the toxicity side. So it has to be very well. Uh, optimized. And the other thing that we saw with that is that through GCMS analysis of the uh, volatiles, we actually saw that the essential profile, the oil profile of the plants was also affected through these nanomaterials. And basically, uh, both the content and the profile was uh, altered. So, a way also to play with uh, essential oil profile in aromatic pharmaceutical plants. There is I'm not going to go through great detail about all of the different materials we previously examined or currently screening. Just briefly, as I said before, there is many, many different versions. This is a version where, for example, we evaluated the use of modified multivolt carbon nanotubes. Uh, so, in abbreviation MWCNPs, this was again in basal uh, plants, with basal plants and the salt stress. And again, in specific concentrations, we did manage to achieve protection against stress. And this was linked with the regulation of the antioxidant defense apparatus, the enzymatic antioxidant defense apparatus, by upregulating major antioxidant enzymes such as ascorbic peroxidase, uh, glutathione peroxidase, and catalase, for example. But for me, a more exciting aspect of the nanomaterial story is not really for their direct application, uh, but taking advantage of their nano scale. These are uh, materials that are in the nanometers you see uh, size. So they can act as extremely good carriers that can reach uh, desirable uh, targets in the plant because they're also translocated uh, when they're functionalized with specific chemical compounds that can include natural metabolites that I mentioned before that could act potentially or be recognized as biostimulants. So thus having the optimized delivery through the nano size of the carrier, but actually the priming effect of the uh, priming agent itself. So this huge uh, uh, potential to synthesize many functionalized nanomaterials. Uh, this is an example of a work that was uh, published on a grapevine that was under salt stress in, uh, uh, by actually applying functionalized carbon quantum dots uh, that were functionalized with putrescine, which is a, a, a polymer that I mentioned before. And this resulted in protection against salt stress in the aforementioned cut. Uh, this is an example of uh, serum oxide nanoparticles, but of course, this should have been further behind. Uh, in the order of things, but just another material that results in protection against salt stress. But another other potential solutions that are quite exciting, for example, this is POWS. POWS is a nanomaterial that is effectively has a, a backbone of polyamine in silica. So it's a polyamine in silica based nanoparticles. So this would even be examined as a potential biofertilizing uh, formulation. And the other positive uh, thing about this is that we can conjugate these POS nanoparticles with fluorescent dyes in order to monitor the smart delivery in plant. So currently we have a paper submitted on this in plants that are under stress. 
And I repeat that this is interesting because the polyamine and silicatase uh, could effectively, especially if uh, synthesized in a sustainable fashion, could effectively be potentially examined for biofertilization approaches. Uh, and the other thing that we're heavily, heavily involved in is trying to engineer conjugates of polymers. So natural polymers like hydrogen, and we can conjugate, engineer basically hydrogen polymers with uh, major priming agents that have shown great uh, uh, efficiency, such as melatonin. So this is a recently published paper where we actually created conjugates of melatonin with chitosan treating plants against severe salt stress. Here you can see plants that were under salt stress that had severely stunted growth and plants that were actually primed with our melatonin and hydrogen conjugates. As you can see, the improvement in the phenotype is quite dramatic. Uh, so many, many different uh, options, scenarios to actually work with. And this can be further uh, validated. This is another work uh, of ours uh, that involve the creation of hydrogen putroskin nanoparticles. And this is for the protection of plants against heavy metals. And this actually was supported by uh, indeed actually showing that the concentration of cadmium in both uh, roots and leaves uh, was severe, uh, significantly suppressed in plants that were treated with our conjugates. So a very nice uh, phytoremediating uh, approach using natural uh, conjugates like that involving hydrogen and putroskin in a specific scenario. And also there is the option of using nanofertilizers uh, through other approaches such as uh, hydrogen selenium nanoparticles. This is another research carried out recently uh, in the, through our collaboration uh, with Reza, where we actually examined the effect of hydrogen selenium nanoparticles, pneumomorbid catarantia, plants under salt stress. And indeed, these plants did actually have improved performance under salt stress, but also, and this was supported also by gene expression studies of various defense related uh, uh, different uh, transcripts, but also transcripts involved in secondary metabolite biosynthesis, because this plant is quite interesting for uh, pharmaceutical compound uh, uh, use. And also, we noticed that actually the application of these kydos and selenium nanoparticles improved the nutritional status of the plant. So, quite interesting uh, observations, I would say, that are quite relevant with this field. Um, so we actually developed a working model uh, that summarizes that this approach can be done both at the plant level through foliar application or root uh, watering, but also at the seed level through coatings with our uh, polymers. And indeed, improved performance can be achieved by improving uh, physiological parameters like photosynthetic uh, activity. Uh, we have increased water use efficiency, which is quite important improved protein protection and antioxidant activity, and then lowering of uh, membrane damage, nitro-oxidative stress responses, and also regulation of uh, secondary metabolism. So an exciting field that we keep on working uh, to this day. Uh, and this will be the very last section of the talk because I can see I'm reaching the 40 minute mark. So I will try, as I said, to be not to be too tired. Uh, the good thing with priming technologies is that they offer uh, a doorway to both worlds, both fundamental science for academics, but also for application potential for growers, which is what it's all about. Uh, so our belief is that uh, the next level of the research is to develop a cost-effective means of promoting plant growth from the time of seeding throughout the maturity of the plant. And also, practically, we should steer away from using agrochemicals in the tree form because they require frequent application of plants and crops. And also we have worries of leaching phenomena that would result or will result in severe environmental and economic issues. So in other words, we are focusing on the treatment of seeds because this is practically much easier and economically much more efficient than treatments at the later developmental stage. And one should not forget that this is a big business and that since the global market for seed is valued at about $65 billion with an annual growth rate of about 6.6% uh, being uh, foreseen.
So this covers uh, proprietary technologies. We actually have two proprietary technologies that are protected uh, by patents. So one of them is Nostec that is involved with the synthetic donor that I mentioned before, where we actually have achieved significant improvements in uh, growth of uh, plants. But recently also we got very exciting results on improved yield of plants that were seed primed with these compounds uh, under false dose conditions. And uh, another solution that uh, is proprietary, is protected, is a solution where through a collaboration, we have developed a biodegradable hydrogel coating. Uh, so uh, basically this coating uh, is alginate based and uh, it is functionalized with different, could be functionalized with different priming agents, including natural metabolites, as I said. And again, we have data showing uh, improved performance of plants under both control, but also stress conditions. So exciting solutions uh, at the seed priming, seed coating level. In this case, offering uh, functionalized uh, biodegradable, biocompatible coatings. And uh, of course, uh, the important thing is the application. So now we have reached the advanced level of TRL7, uh, which is testing prototypes in field trials. And this is currently being happening in multiple different crops, representing different conditions in different climates. So we currently have ongoing tests uh, of our technologies on muskmelon and jerk in, uh, in Holland, uh, test uh, on tomato and pepper on control plants in Greece. Uh, as I said before, trials on uh, salt stressed plants in Saudi Arabia. We are planning to do an approach where we will try to alleviate heat stress effects in baby spinach plants. And this will take place with a collaborating company here in Cyprus. And we're also currently scheduling new trials of our technologies in Italy, Spain, and Guatemala. So, uh, closing, of course, none of this would be possible without the, 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 the help of the people in the group. I would like to thank uh, all of them for all of their hard work. Of course, all of the funding agencies that helped to make this happen. And very, very importantly, have very, very good collaborators that believe in this technology, including Durkin Zays Group in Ghent, Ali Furness Group that helps with the economics in Max Planck, uh, Reza Gohari that is a tremendous help with the nanomaterial work, Rafaela Balestrini in CNR in Torino, who helps a lot with biological priming. Theodora Krasia Christoforov, who is also helping with the development of the uh, biodegradable polymer coatings, and Kosher Opaspi, who is the co inventor of the MOSH tech proprietary technology. And this is the very last slide, promise. <laughs> uh, just to actually let you know, in case it is not known, that. Uh, Inform you of the presence of plant stress, which is a gold open access journal published by Xavier. As the title suggests, it is a journal that is focused on plant stress responses, covering all sorts of stresses, such as uh, excess or uh, lack of water, soil stress, extreme temperatures, uh, hypoxic anoxic responses, mineral excess or deficiency, metals, fungal infections, uh, biotic stresses, and so on. So. Uh, I'm happy to say that although we are very young, only two years old, we're scheduled to obtain our first input factor this summer. And we currently have a site score of uh, tracking value of 3.2. So we expect to actually have established a strong position in the field of plant science. So with this, I would like to invite you all to consider the journal in case um, the, the audience includes academics and research uh, researchers to consider the journal or potential submission of your work. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, presentation. Now we will have a Q&A section. I just want sure. to remind that uh, it's uh, still possible uh, to submit uh, your questions uh, and uh, please use uh, the Q&A box uh, at the bottom uh, of your screen. So we have already uh, received uh, a couple of questions. So I will uh, start uh, immediately with the first one. So uh, we have seen your experience and uh, research about uh, priming. 
And the question is, uh, priming is uh, uh, based on your experience, uh, effective for every plant or species, or uh, there are differences? Uh, uh, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, I, I'm sorry, to be honest with you, I was actually reading through the questions on the, on the text here, so I got a bit carried away. Could you repeat that? Oh, okay, sorry. yeah, yeah, sure, sure, don't worry. This yeah, is uh, my question, my <laughs> curiosity. So I, I, I apologize. Okay, okay. So, if uh, based on your experience, priming is effective for uh, every plant species, uh, or there are differences? Uh, actually, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, it does seem to be uh, quite a horizontal technology. So, effectively, in our efforts to actually validate or examine the potential, we have tried so far many, many different crop categories. So we have uh, applied this in horticulture crops, uh, such as tomato and cucumber and marshmallow, as I said before. We've applied it on legumes, such as medicago, uh, cereals, such as wheat and maize. Uh, recently, as I said, we started applying this in soft fruit, of course, horticultural, but of a different nature, if that makes sense. So, so far, uh, these beneficial observations have been observed in horizontal fashion. So, there doesn't seem to be any clear limitations. Even when it comes to physiological performance, like comparing C3 and C4 plants, we have seen positive effects in C4 plants such as maize. So even that does not appear to be a limited factor. We have not tested it, for example, in cam plants, but this is quite specialized. And of course, there are zero points. So it wouldn't really, for us, make great sense at the time being to actually focus on that. But the validation portfolio is quite extended, so it doesn't look like there is any specific limitation I can think of on which species to actually apply this to. It's okay, quite important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, so next question uh, in the q and box. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, I have seen some companies market liquid nanofertilizers that would typically be considered as ions in solutions. One example would be zinc sulfate and nanofertilizer. Can you explain the difference between plant application of ion solutions compared to application of nanoparticles? Uh, to be honest, I mean, this, uh, this question is uh, uh, catching me a bit off guard. I mean, I cannot really now explain the difference between the two applications. I mean, if this is like a, a complex a complex solutions, I mean, I would have to know the exact composition in each case, for example. So uh, now the, the answer is that uh, I, I will be happy to actually uh, try to have a think about this and actually get back to file with more detail uh, because on the top of my head, uh, I wouldn't be able to compare, you know, commercial non-fertilizers without even knowing exact compositions with, uh, you know, the particles that we've been using as well. Uh, if it is a bit more specific, I can, I, I will be happy to actually try to come up with a more clear response to that. This is the, the honest answer. Yeah, yeah, sure. I would also to remind that maybe uh, the person who was asking this question can uh, send uh, the question uh, of course, uh, of course. to our website, biosimulant.com, where we have a specific uh, section for uh, it questions. It's possible Maybe to we send can more ask... specific information yeah. on the exact compositions, like to, to get a more informed view of what Kyle is talking about. And then I would be happy to try to provide an answer to the specific question, but provide some specific you know, information with the uh, formulations that in question. Okay, sure. So let's go ahead with another question. Uh, the question is, uh, what, we, what is the minimum and maximum duration of uh, seed priming? Again, this is like quite a general question. It's a logical <laughs> question, but it isn't a question that just has a specific answer. I mean, uh, everybody should understand that uh, each experimental setup requires uh, the knob optimization. So different species, uh, different uh, cultivars even, uh, different conditions of stress. Uh, every single time we have to optimize the experimental approach that includes anything from the mode of application of the agent, even in the case of seed priming, because it can be done by soaking, it can be done through vacuum filtration, it can be done through uh, the coating effect, as I said before, and each approach 
behaves differently in every different experimental setup. So, sure. for example, in the case of seed priming, uh, there's cases where soaking the seeds in solutions will provide substantial improvements within a four hour window. Whereas in other cases, this can be extended to eight hours or 12 hours. So, as I said, there is not, ans not one answer fits everything, you know. So there is variability between different scenarios that we tested before that is mainly species specific uh, and in some cases, even uh, genotype specific. So I don't know if this answers the question, but uh, uh, there is variation. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be expected to last for ages. You know? So the longest we've actually uh, provided the, uh, the agent on the seed was we tried like a 24 hour uh, soak, uh, going down to four hours, as I said. But of course, the story changes dramatically if you actually have the approach of the coatings. Because there, the whole point of that is that you have a controlled release. And actually, by playing with the composition of the coating itself, we can actually manipulate the release rate as well. Because a prolonged release in the rhizosphere actually has some benefits. There, it's a different story. And we can actually do the coatings in a way, the functionalized coatings, that the release is much more prolonged in the rhizosphere. But again, reaching levels of uh, a week or two weeks, not again something that will be lasting for ages, you know, because you also care about the quick establishment of the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is another question, I think, uh, related to the previous one. Uh, the question is, is it possible for a plant that uh, memory developed through priming is uh, transferred into generation, so from one generation to another? Well, that, this is also a very important question, actually, because there are clear indications that one of the benefits of uh, priming is a seed state. Uh, there is clear indications that the uh, responses uh, like protection or improvements can be transferred uh, transgenerationally because there is uh, even work published, in, not in great depth, but there is clear suggestions that we have a number of epigenetic modifications happening. Uh, so we have seen transgenerational effects in certain uh, approaches, especially with physiological priming. Uh, this is something we're looking into further. And we're actually a big part of our current fundamental uh, research is focusing on trying to actually decipher these epigenetic approaches. But yes, there seems to be the potential for plants to develop a memory in order to transfer this transgeneration to offspring. So yes. Okay, very interesting. So another question, um, it's about uh, the biological priming. So you showed a few slides uh, about mm -hmm. uh, Arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi. And the question is, is uh, what's your take on seed priming with the beneficial bacteria, PGPR, if you have any information? Yeah, I mean, again, through collaborations with experts in the field, we're also evaluating uh, PGPRs. Uh, so yes, it is a reality. It's something that we're also testing. Uh, it is actually, I wouldn't say common, but quite a lot of groups appear to be working on this uh, subject. The one thing I can say is that when working with the microorganisms, in this case with PGPRs specifically, what we did observe on the scenario of trying to uh, apply this in conjunction with some of those polymers that I mentioned before, is that we have had negative effects on the growth of these uh, microorganisms. So trying to actually coat the seeds with polymers where we'll actually somehow create a formulation that will try to include your bacteria. Actually, we've seen that these polymers actually show antimicrobial activity themselves. And there is actually quite a lot of work that have shown that this is used, like chitin, for example, or chitin is used for you know, protection. So initial efforts to, to examine this show the negative correlation with the, uh, the PGPRs in question. So yes, for direct applications, uh, it's quite common. In terms of trying to provide coatings with that, there is technical difficulties, I would say, at least in our case. But this is something we're trying to optimize further now to see if this can be resolved. 
But yeah, I, I think that I'm aware of quite a lot of groups working with uh, microorganisms. It is a possibility. Very good. Uh, we have one more question before uh, closing this webinar uh, about uh, uh, priming products uh, and uh, biotic uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, if you have uh, considered how priming products would be regulated, especially if they are focused on biotic resistance, and would this still be categorized as a known pesticides biostimulant? Well, uh, <laughs> well, again, this is a, like a regulatory question. I mean, recently, uh, I, I will be honest. I mean, uh, the, the regulatory aspect of the biostimulants, I've only recently been introduced to that by attending uh, the lovely conference that Danny Hill and actually organized in Ghent in September. Uh, I realize I, I am aware of the fact that the biopesticidal, biopesticidal formulations uh, are, are under much stronger uh, regulatory control than, for example, biofertilizing formulations. Uh, now, in terms of how they would be regulated, I mean, it depends on the actual formulation per se, what is the exact composition, and what is the link with the end response. Uh, as I mentioned before, our focus is the abiotic uh, tolerance. We haven't really been observing biotic stress responses, so this is not a focus main focus of our group, and hence the lack of further information because this is not one of our major interests. But as far as I'm aware, uh, the regulatory activity is quite strict. Uh, so I would imagine that it would be possible, but more time consuming uh, than uh, in other situations. Uh, but this is a technical uh, question about regulation, and I don't think qualified to answer to such uh, regulatory, uh, you know, concepts. I will be more happy to actually try to answer about scientific aspects or, you know, the academic side of things. It is to my understanding though, that the biopesticides are much more heavily regulated. So it would depend on the envelope submitted for approval. The link with the concept of uh, biopesticides, the, uh, the trials that have actually been carried out, because I think there's regulations about the number of trials and the validity and the replicates, and the, uh, it's quite complex. Uh, but compared to, for example, other uh, formulations that are not uh, biopesticides, uh, regulatory activities for normal uh, fungicides or pesticides are even you know, lengthier in time. So it is feasible, I think. Okay, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I had a small connection problem. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm I'm back. And uh, so it was the last uh, question for uh, today. Thank you uh, for your answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to to thank you again also for the presentation. And mm -hmm. I would also I'd like to thank everybody for uh, attending uh, the webinar. And please, uh, if uh, you still have the questions, uh, you can submit them on biostimulant.com uh, website where there is a specific uh, section called Ask the Experts and uh, our scientific committee will get back to you with the answers. So I would like to remind you that the recorded version of this webinar will be available soon on biostimulant.com and also on our social media. Uh, have a nice day, everybody, and thank I you. hope to see you on the next uh, webinar. Bye. Thank you. Take care, Elisa. Bye, everyone.